This is the um, Great Lakes Equity Center first uh, webinar in this webinar series. And um, so welcome. And the title or topic of our discussion this afternoon is Educational Equity, What's It All About? And I would like to, again, welcome everyone to this interactive webinar. And um, my name is Sina Skelton. I am the director of the Great Lakes Equity Center. And I'm joined by my uh, webinar uh, presenting team, and I will let my co-presenters and uh, web uh, facilitator introduce themselves. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Kigamwa, and uh, I'll be co-presenting this webinar with Dr. Sina Skelton. I'm a research associate at the Great Lakes Equity Center. I really look forward to chatting with you all and uh, getting to hear from you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Camille Warren. I'm one of the assistant directors here at the center, and I will be behind the scenes hosting this webinar today. If you have any technical difficulties, um, you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen right now there's a chat box. You can just shoot me a note, and we'll try to work out uh, whatever's going on. So welcome, and we're looking forward to talking with you all. So before we get started with our talk this afternoon, we'd just like to um, talk a little bit about who we are. And, uh, and what we do, so we are, again, the Great Lakes Equity Center. We have one of 10 regional equity assistance centers funded by the U.S. Department of Education under um, Title IV of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The, um, as the Great Lakes Equity Center, we provide technical assistance and professional learning to state education agencies as well as uh, public school districts. Um, and supports around school improvement and school reform in the areas of supporting all students, but specifically um, providing supports for students in the areas of race, gender, and national origin. You can see sort of to our right here the, uh, our uh, Great Lakes region. So we serve the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, and of course, Indiana. We are actually housed in Indianapolis, Indiana, at um, Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. So again, welcome. And we look forward to having an interactive uh, presentation with you this afternoon. Just to get started and sort of orient ourselves to how we are going to interact uh, during this presentation, just wanted to set the stage and frame our time together. This presentation is designed to be interactive. So participants will be asked to join in real-time group discussions via either chat or by using your the, uh, microphone or your computer if you are able to do so. So this webinar, unlike some webinars that you may have participated in in the past or previously, um, is designed to be interactive. So we are asking people to, to think and reflect individually and then to participate um, and, and really have a conversation going. One of the major um, parts of working towards equity or a major strategy towards working towards equity is that of reflection and discussion. And so we're going to bring those elements into this webinar. Um, this afternoon. Um, to reduce noise distractions, audio will be enabled only during designated points in the presentation. And um, I will either cue you or James will cue you to when um, your mics will be open and you will be um, enabled to share out verbally with the team. Um, otherwise, the chat box is always open and you can um, post questions, um, make comments, uh, communicate thoughts and reflections um, at any time during the presentation uh, via your chat box function. Also, at the end of this presentation, um, all webinar materials will be accessible um, on our website. And our website is at www.greatlakesequitycenter.org. You will also be able to download uh, materials that we will do. Now, as uh, our director, Sina, said, this is the first in a series of possible future webinars. And so we wanted to start uh, uh, with first things first and just to lay a very clear foundation of the basics. And so we have um, three uh, clear goals or objectives for today's webinar. First, we, we hope uh, that by the end of this session, you should be able to articulate a strong rationale for advancing educational equity 
in your local setting. Secondly, we hope that by the end of this session, you will be able to discuss the relationship between equity and equality. And I know these two terms can get a, a little sticky sometimes. We have uh, people using them synonymously sometimes. But our hope is that by the end of this session, you will be able to see a very clear distinction between uh, uh, equity and equality as these two terms relate to uh, teaching and learning in education. And then finally, we, 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 we hope that by the end of this session, you will be able to apply two or three strategies to begin to crit critically examine your own practices related to promoting equitable learning environments. Now, to just get us started now, um, I'd like us to reflect on uh, on the term equity. I know we all have uh, different uh, understandings of this term, and so just take a minute and um, tell us what does equity mean to you, and this is your opportunity to start uh, typing on the chat. So in one or two words, just uh, type in what you understand this term to mean to you. Thank you. I can see a number of us are chat uh, typing in. Great. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, Tara. It's fairness and partial. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we'll hold on for a couple more of you to type in something. Yeah, thank you all. I think we, uh, let me read a couple. Um, Tara, everyone having equal access to and getting what they need. Um, Lauren, being fair and impartial and providing equal opportunities, fairness, fairness, fair, access for all, equity means fair opportunities for all, not the same, fairness, considering the needs of others regardless of race, gender and socioeconomic status. Uh, those are really good ways that, of looking at equity. It's like a uh, looking at a picture and we all see it and uh, we are able to communicate what we see slightly differently but we we all seem to agree on what is portrayed and so during the rest of this session we will try and articulate more clearly what uh, equity means. I think I'll hand over to Sina to take us to the next session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you all for your, your um, thoughts about equity and, and so it's clear that, that people have definite ideas, um, a definite uh, vision, a definite vision of what, what it means to provide or be equitable or provide equity. Um, and so we asked the question, um, what motivates us to um, work towards advancing equitable practices on equity? Um, and, and particularly in our world, our, our world of uh, K-12 education, what, what are we talking about and what What's the impetus for it? Is equity an education mandate? Or is it a moral imperative? Are we, are we called to, to focus on equity because um, the law tells us to? Or are we really motivated and called because it's, it's an imperative, um, it's a moral imperative, it's educators that, that we strive for for an equitable learning environment. And in fact, it's not an either or, but it, it's in fact both. And I, some of the concepts and some of the words that, that you all have shared um, are really embedded in, in this, if not the language of the law, if not uh, the spirit. And so we look at Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and I just underlined really some key words or phrases in this piece of legislation. 
And the the Civil Rights Act caused us to um, to be conscious that we're not excluding students from participating in, but not only participating in, but denying the benefits or um, being subjected to discrimination under any program that receives federal funds. That, that includes our public schools. So any program that, um, and, and are we, in fact, um, assuring that all students are um, able to benefit and, and receive the benefits from, um, from our educational system. And these programs are, we're talking about all programs, so from admissions to academic programs, so we think about our gifted and talented programs, we think about our, um, advanced placement programs, we think about our, um, our everyday uh, general education programs. Um, in terms of student treatment, in terms of discipline, in terms of classroom assignments and grading, that when we are ensuring that we are um, not discriminating or, or putting in place barriers that that um, exclude certain groups of students from benefiting from these programs, that we are in fact um, working towards equity, and this is part of the spirit of um, this piece of legislation. So we are called to think about equity and to have it as a vision um, by, by the law of the land. But we're also motivated, not just because it's law, um, not just because it's the, it, it encompasses, encompasses the spirit of the law, but we're also called to do this because it's a moral imperative. And this is something that is really, um, has, has, uh, idea that's been communicated across um, people across disciplines, whether we're talking about um, educator, education scholars, um, this is a quote by Henry Levin, who's a scholar at Columbia University in Education, who talks about the quest for educational equity as a moral imperative. Um, whether we're listening to or, or, or talking about civil rights leaders, where you can see this quote from Jesse Jackson, um, education is for all, and that is a moral imperative to our um, governmental leaders today. And we have a quote here by Arnie Duncan, just from 2010, equity, again, equity through education reform. And so this whole idea about equity um, being something that we're, that we're called to do is framed and anchored in law and also framed and anchored in our, as a, in our own consciousness in terms of what, what our role is for all students. And so with that in mind, we take a, we take a step backwards and we reflect on one of the, um, the um, foundation of, if you will, um, Supreme Court cases that immediately caused us to question whether or not how we were educating students in the past, um, what that meant and how that piece of law, that piece of that court case has really um, had an impact on education today. So we look at Brown versus Board of Education um, as that, you know, that seminal case that talked about separate not being equal and talked about the, the called really us to focus on um, this notion of equal access. And even when we think about the outcomes today and what we've been able to do um, more than 50 years after that case, that unfortunately many students, um, students of color, um, are still denied the access access to the education that they need in order to find meaningful jobs and, and to contribute to, um, to society. And so we're still focused on that vision. We're still working towards that idea of making sure that everyone has equal access. And so we think about equal access, what does that mean in terms of equity? What are the concerns today that really um, um, highlight um, the issues related to equity. Why are we concerned about equity today? Well, we're concerned because we know we have achievement gaps, opportunity gaps. Um, we know there's certain groups of students, um, are, are there are persistent gaps in uh, academic performance and achievement of certain groups of, of students, and we typically hear about that, hear about those gaps in terms of achievement gaps, but we want to reframe that and talk about that in terms of our opportunity gaps, that we know that certain groups of students um, are not provided the opportunities that will enable them to be successful in, in, in schools and beyond. And so we're concerned about that. We're concerned about 
issues such as disproportionality, that is the underrepresentation of certain groups of students in um, particular in specific programs such as um, gifted and talented programs or advanced placement programs or um, certain enrichment or, or, or um, educational programs that um, that, are, that will most likely advance students to um, university or college or uh, career post high school um, and students that are um, overrepresented and uh, special education um, placement in specific special education categories or students that are overrepresented in terms of the discipline related to suspending students or expelling students. And we look at dis disparities in student outcomes, whether we're talking about graduation rates, whether we're talking about office referrals. So these are all issues that, um, that we're concerned about as educators, that we're all concerned about, and that we've been working on for the working on um, very specifically over the past 10 or 20 years. Um, and so equity helps us frame that and think about it, that in terms of what do we need to do and how do we need to create an environment where these issues are um, no longer uh, persisting in our, in our educational system. So what do we mean by equity? We've been using this term equity and we have yet to define it. So what do we mean when we talk about equity? Thank you, Sina. Um, so we've provided us a, a, a short, a detailed definition of what we understand educational equity to mean. And uh, uh, we'd like to just take a few minutes to now try to dig into uh, what we mean by equity, having looked at equity being a, a civil right and a moral imperative, and again, realizing again from a seen as a presentation that uh, there are opportunity gaps and there's disproportional representation in, uh, in our schools and disparities in student outcomes. So, so what do we mean by equity? Let me read out this uh, definition and then we'll try and uh, respond to some of the issues that uh, we present in this definition. So educational equity is when educational practices policies, curricula, resources, and school cultures are representative of all students, such that each student has access to and can participate in and make progress in high quality planning experiences, regardless of her or his race, socioeconomic status, gender, ability, religion, national origin, linguistic diversity, or any other characteristic that we may not have mentioned in this definition that could be identified with the specific groups of uh, individuals in our schools. So we're looking at uh, education that is representative in terms of practices, policies, curriculum, resources, and um, we, we hope to see that uh, every student has uh, access fair access and can participate to access a high quality education and remove limitations that are based on race, uh, gender, social class, religion and other uh, identifiers. Now I'd like us to look at this definition again, uh, each of us, and uh, I'd like us to uh, respond to, to look at it. We're going to put it in the middle of, the, of your screen. And uh, I'd like you to share some of the concepts that may have resonated with you. And uh, you should be able to scroll down and see the whole definition up there. Uh, feel free to write in the chat. And uh, we'll also turn on your mics and we'll allow you to be able to, to speak if you would like to share something. Um, so let's go ahead and write, and if you're ready to share something that uh, you made a connection with from the definition, you need to raise your hand and we'll activate your mic. Thank you. Keep typing. I can see a number of us are typing.
Thanks, Carol. Yes, thank you, Tara. Yeah. And the notion of all students. Yep. Yes, all students and then participation and progress. Thank you. Carol, do you do you have your do you have a your microphone on? Would you be able to shed a little more light into uh, the different cultural views on our responsibility? Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Rose. I just read your comment about gender identity and expression. Absolutely. That that and oftentimes we do sort of um sort of put those characteristics in, in, in sort of the, the category of other characteristics. But absolutely we're talking about all students regardless of their their individual characteristics. That and and, and more than regardless, but, but to um Understand the richness. Understand the the um, the contributions that that we all make based on our individual differences and our individual uh, uh, similarities. And so, thank you for bringing that up in terms of gender expression or identity. Thank you, Gwen. And uh, I think as we provide more webinars and uh, other forms of professional learning opportunities, I think uh, uh, teachers should be able to benefit from uh, learning how to improve their curricula to become more engaging uh, with regard to meeting the needs of all students. So thank you all for for your reflecting on some of those core embedded concepts. We're going to come back and revisit that in just a, in just a few seconds. Um, we're going to move forward and listen to a brief video clip by uh, Dr. Pedro Nugera from the um, from New York University. Um, he is an educational scholar around urban education and equity and school reform. And let's listen in while uh, Dr. Nugera talks about equity in education. Okay. Uh, is it working? Okay. Well, in the context of education, the term equity has come to mean the need to focus more directly, not simply on equal opportunity, that is making sure that kids have access to schools and the opportunity theoretically to learn, but really focusing on outcomes and results. And the analogy I often make is uh, most parents practice equity with their kids. That is, we don't treat all kids the same because they have different needs. And when in schools that, that are really focused on equity, they're trying to meet the different needs of kids and do so in ways with a focus on outcomes. Okay, so we um, heard in the video that that equity is about really the outcomes that we're seeing for students. And so we are uh, outcome driven. We think about equitable practices that, um, and this takes us a little bit further than equal access. So oftentimes when, when we hear, we engage in conversations around uh, equity or equality, we sort of stop at that sort of notion of access. Um, 
will all students have access? And I, I often hear this when I'm talking with, with, with teachers who are working with different students who may be struggling in the notion of, well, you know, they're, ex they're accessing the same curriculum that my other students are accessing, and so I, I am being fair. And, and when we think about equity, we're taking it a step further from access to participation from participation to actually making progress. So this whole notion of being outcome focused, outcome driven, to give us an indicator of how equitable our environment, our learning environment is. So I see Toya has her hand up. You have a question? You can type your question in, Toya. I'll try to address that. But let's let's sort of um, unpack this a little bit because when we think about equity, it's such a big um, idea, and the the definition is quite full. And so, if you want to boil it down to three sort of kernels of of, of understanding, um, these would be, I think, the three. So, when we think about equity, we're talking about representation. Representation really on two on two levels. So first, in terms of curriculum and instruction, are we providing a curriculum that's really representative of all of the students that we are that we're teaching? So are we providing are we using curricular materials that are that reflect the images and the cultural histories and the perspectives of all of our students um, and, and all of your students in your in your class, all of our students in our schools? Or are we are we presenting a curriculum that's from one one perspective only? And most often we are presenting curriculum that's from a Eurocentric or Euro American centric perspective, while other stories, other people's stories and histories and, and cultural practices and lived experiences are either ignored or are marginalized to, to the sort of margins of, of, of instruction. And so how are we ensuring, how are we making sure that we are presenting curriculum that's really representative of our students? Um, when we use examples, so not just curriculum materials or the images that are on our walls or, or the books that are in our libraries, but also the, the examples that we're using. So we we're using examples of, 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 of successful writers or contributors to the arts or um, uh, scientists that were, that were using examples that are um, uh, women, that are women, we think about the uh, sciences, or people of color, or people from different gender expressions or identities, that we're, or diff people from different um, economic backgrounds, that we're using examples and exemplars of, of people that are representative of the, the school community and of the, all of the students in, in your class and, and in your learning community. So that, uh, in terms of representation, is very important. And we, particularly when we talk about representation, um, oftentimes when we strive to do this in education, we go back in time, we go back in history, and so we may talk about um, so, some a historical figure. But it is just as important that we identify and highlight um, contemporary leaders in science, in, in uh, literature, in the arts, in technology um, that's representative of our students, not, not only people from, uh, from our history. So the, the term, uh, the idea of representation in terms of our curriculum and instruction. Um, also in terms of our instructional modalities. So are we using instructional methods that are, um, that reflect sort of the, the um, practices, if you will, the, the, um, the orientations that, that's for all of our students. So are we using a variety of instructional strategies and modalities so that we are likely to hit the learning preferences of all of our students? But then you take representation on a different level as well. So you talk about representation in terms of decision-making decision -making bodies or representation in terms of uh, programming. So are we ensuring, what are we doing to ensure that we have representation of people of color, students of color, in certain in, um, educational programs? So our, our STEM programs, our uh, gifted and talented programs, our advanced placement programs, are we ensuring, what are we doing? What, how are we looking at our policies? How are we looking at our practices to ensure that we have representation um, in those programs as well? But not only in programming, but also in decision making. So when you look at your PTL or your PTAs, are you seeing families that are really reflective of the learning community? We look at you know who's on our curriculum committee, who's on our different decision making bodies in our schools. Are we reflecting the the backgrounds and, and um, the uh, 
the different groups that are really represented with um, throughout our school community. Um, not just the majority, but everyone. And so when we think about representation, it's a very complex idea to unpack, but that's something that's central to the notion of equity. Representation goes hand in hand with access. You really can't have representation if you don't have access. How are we ensuring that everyone has equal access to these programs and equal access to participating in um, not just curricular um, programs, but also, again, in those decision-making bodies that, that really um, put in place policy and practices in our schools? And then, again, those outcomes. When we look at our outcome data, are we seeing um, patterns of uh, disparities um, among certain groups? And if so, those are, those are red flags or indicators that we need to address um, equitable practices in our schools and in our classrooms. So we're going to actually look at a story that may help us think about these concepts within the, within the classroom scenario. OK, thank you, Sina. Um, so let me introduce this story. Um, it's a story that uh, exposes a story, uh, the issue of placement within the classroom. And uh, as teachers, you probably resonate with some of the issues that will, will, will come up. It's a story about a fourth grader uh, whose name is Juan. And um, Miss Jones, who is uh, Juan's uh, class teacher classroom teacher and uh, Miss Jones is uh, young and energetic and she truly loves her students and wants all of them to perform well and uh, we also have one's mother Mrs. Otez like all mothers she wants the best for her son and then we have the advanced science group uh, this class is constituted from students uh, with students from other fourth grade classes and uh, each fourth grade class uh, teacher nominates four students to be in this advanced classroom so what we'll do now um, will uh, allow you to look at the story it's going to be posted or placed in the middle of the screen but you should also be able to download it and uh, we'll give you three minutes to, to read it. So you could read it from the screen. You could enlarge your screen or maximize it. On the other hand, on the bottom of the page, um, we have a PDF link which you could uh, click and download. So you have three minutes to just read through this story. And in order to maximize, if you click up, look at your top right, part of the screen, you will see something, a key or button that says full screen. If you click on full screen, that will, that will maximize the screen. It may be easier to read the, uh, the, the scenario. And if you're reading from the screen, we'll just scroll down a bit.
Okay, we just have about 30 more seconds and then we'll advance to the next uh, slide. Okay, I think we're ready to move to the next slide. Uh, Jeffrey, thanks for your comment. I hope we'll be able to keep that when we move to the next slide. If we can't, I'm going to copy it and I'll paste it. But on the other hand, you could simply copy it and wait, and you may need to repaste it just in case we lose it. But I'm not so sure what will happen. Okay, thanks Camille for copying that. Uh, so we've read the story and um, in uh, three or four sentences, uh, please share a connection you made with any of the individuals. Uh, maybe you connected with the teacher, maybe your connection was with the uh, one, or maybe as a mother you were able to make a very clear connection with Mrs. Otis and uh, briefly explain their perspective to the issue. And uh, feel free to um, put up your hand if you'd like to speak. So we will turn on your mic. Well, while we're waiting for people to type, and just wanted to address. Uh, Jeffrey's comment and, and just say, you know, absolutely understand that, um, and this is really what we're, what 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 the point is. Whose story do we need to to um, tell, and whose story are we telling, and what does it mean when we only tell one story? How are we setting up students to see themselves, and and what it actually means to be successful in school? And, and and that school really is a microcosm, really, of society. So we can't, you know, right now we're talking about K-12 and we're talking about um, equity and, and Jeffrey brings up the point of justice. So we're talking about that in terms of our current school system. But this is not an issue that's just um, only um, a part of our school system that we're, that in all of our institutions, we have issues of inequalities and, and inequities and um, but right now we, we live as educators in this world of school but but we need to think about the um, that education is situated within a larger context so thank you for that um, Jeffrey that comment and and I think that we when we talk about the relationship between equality and equity I, I hope it speaks to your comment just a little bit um, we would like to hear voices, others, uh, other voices. So, if you, anyone, would like to share out um, for the group um, your connections or perspectives, and just reactions to the story, we can have a couple of people raise their hand. Toya would like to to share out. Um, Toya, do you have a mic? Are you able to share out verbally, or uh, can you indicate yes? Uh, is there a yes or a happy face if you're able to to share out um, using your mic? If you're um, if you would like to share out using your mic, if you have have your hand up, um, click on allow mic so that we can hear you. So, I, uh, Toya, would you like to share out? Can't okay. Carol, are you able to share out verbally or? Okay, we have most people typing. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Toya. Thank you. 
So people just make any comment or, or, or react to the perspective that you that you sort of uh, resonated with mm -hmm. in the story. Yeah, feel free to type uh, even brief comments. We see multiple people are typing, so that's great. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Yeah, exactly, the home culture. And so what we're going, what we're finding and what we will talk about towards the end of our presentation is really the, the cornerstone of moving towards equity is, is implementing cultural responsive teaching practices. And so understanding the very, um, the very nature of teaching and learning um, is situated within culture and cultural context and understanding culture. So thank you for, for that, Lauren. Gwen? Yeah? Yes, and this whole notion of deficit perspective, absolutely. And, and even though she doesn't realize it, even though she, she has the best interest um, in her thinking, um, she has Juan's best interest in mind in terms of wanting to make sure he's in an environment where he's not over his head, but what she's communicating is, is sort of is a deficit, a deficit approach. So thank you, or a deficit way of thinking. And oftentimes we are we are well-meaning, and, and our teachers and colleagues, and, and are, that that we're people are not making decisions um, that are in fact barriers to equity um, out of malicious intent. Oftentimes it's, it's because of good intentions, but uh, misguided intentions. So. Let's move on because I know we're getting a little bit behind and talk about a little more about why aren't we talking about equality. So this whole notion, we've been, we've been talking about equity, but why not equality? And let's explore that a little bit more. As we discussed earlier, that equality and when we think of um, the Brown versus the Board of Education, that whole, that whole uh, court case is about sort of um, equal access, right? So why are we talking about equality? Equality is derived from this whole concept of fairness and uniform distribution, that everyone is entitled to the same level of access. And certainly we can all get behind that idea. We can, um, I think, you know, I think we can all get behind that idea. Do we, do we want a school environment? We want um, a, a society where everyone has the same opportunity and the same level of access um, that they can take advantage of if they so choose. And so when we talk about equality, that's really what we're, what we're saying. But when society, and Jeffrey, I think, brought this up earlier, when society is stratified in such a way that through our policies, through our practices, through our beliefs and values, um, that we, in effect, privilege some while marginalize others, depending on the dominant culture of that time, whether we're talking about the dominant practices or identities, whether it relates to uh, color, uh, race, national origin, language, sexual orientation or expression, um, gender, wh whatever we're talking about being that dominant sort of perspective that oftentimes, based on those norms, um, we put in place policies that privilege some and marginalize others, and therefore, and thereby, exclude groups of people from the ability to have equal access that's necessary to really um, participate fully in, in our society. Equity is necessary because some are excluded, either that lack of information um, for economic reasons, or just simply don't have the resources, whether you're talking about um, whatever the resources you were, were talking about necessary to fully participate. And so equity attempts to remedy those issues. It, it, it attempts, uh, the ideal of equity, the concept of equity attempts to redress um, the historical injustices that, that have prevented and put, have, um, put in place barriers to access in the first place. And by 
striving for equity, we are striving to really maximize opportunities for access. So how do we maximize those opportunities? If we think about this in terms of a race or a marathon, if we only focus on equality, um, only focusing on equality when everyone has a fair chance to, to win that race. Not that everybody will win the race, but that everyone has a fair chance to, to win. Everyone's equally equipped. Um, they're equal, uh, they're the same kinds of balance uh, barriers or challenges, and so everyone has that equal chance. But we know that groups of, groups of individuals, and, and in our case, groups of students, um, don't really have that equal opportunity. The reality is that many of our young people are still carrying the baggage, the legacy left by the historical injustices of, of the past, and also the contemporary attitudes and beliefs in current policies and practices of today. And so we have people trying to run the race, students trying to run the race, if you will, carrying the, the burden of, of those issues on their backs. And equity, equitable practices are one way in which we try to um, remove that baggage, if you will. So let's take a look and, and revisit uh, Juan's story. And take a look at his story now through an equity lens. So you read the story before. Um, but think of it again and think about what are those equity issues? What do you see? What can we identify um, that are equity issues in that particular scenario? A scenario that's so common in many of our classrooms. And when you think about it, think about it in terms of representation. So what issues um, are highlighted for you in terms of representation, in terms of access, in terms of uh, outcomes? And just take a few minutes, and if you can uh, chime in either uh, through chat or if people are able to uh, uh, call in with their mics, just raise your hand and we will certainly call on you. There's a couple of people. So a couple of people like to share out uh, revisiting Juan's story in terms of what are the equity issues you see in Juan's story. Thank you, Gwen. Yes, that of access, absolutely. That by um, Ms. Jones really not recognizing um, really one's, um, the way in which, or, or Ms. Jones not differentiating the way in which she allows young people to demonstrate what they know and that she is really preventing some students from really accessing opportunities. So here we have this, this, this advanced group, and um, this advanced group First, we'll have the opportunity to present in front of their peers, but I think more importantly, we'll have opportunity to access um, a, a district-wide STEM program. And we know that the, the representation of people of color in those fields, so science, technology, and um, uh, uh, engineering and mathematics fields, that, that there's low representation. And so here we are, see, perpetuated, really, the, the um, barrier to or lack of access to a program that may have an opportunity to address some of, some of that disproportionality that we see. Um, exactly, not even having an opportunity to participate in, in, the, in the class. Um, Juan demonstrated um, funds of knowledge from his own home and, and community um, that reflected his um, capacity and his performance in math. and the teacher, Ms. Jones, not recognizing that, not capitalizing that, that not, um, not realizing it and recognizing and building on that. 
Yes. So we see how how there are issues related in this scenario related to access, related to representation, and related to um, outcomes. Thank you. Thank you all. So let's talk about then what can we avoid when we think about equ equity? What are those pitfalls that we want, want to avoid? We want to avoid this idea that equity requires lowered expectations. And I think that oftentimes um, there, there are uh, people who think that these are sort of, um, that you can't have equity and have excellence. In order to have excellence, you have to somehow lower standards so that everybody can be successful. And that is not what equity is about. Equity is not lowering standards so that everybody can be successful. Equity is actually maintaining high standards, uh, rigorous standards, but putting in place um, supports and um, uh, practices that really enables everyone to be able to strive to meet those standards. Um, equity is not treating everyone the same in the name of fairness. Instead, equity is about differentiating our actions so the way we interact with one another, the way teachers interact with students and families, um, is differentiating the kinds of supports that are put in place, the curricular supports, the instructional supports, the uh, emotional and behavioral um, supports, and using strategies based on students' strengths and talents and preferences, and, as well as really understanding students' home home lived experiences and tapping into those experiences, building on students' funds of knowledge and differentiating our instruction based on that. Yeah, so um, in addition to that, uh, equity is providing multiple means for representation, expression and engagement. And uh, recognizing that uh, children from different uh, social backgrounds or cultural backgrounds um, uh, express themselves differently and uh, those opportunities need to be provided and the teacher needs to be uh, sensitive and careful enough to be able to recognize as in the case of uh, one that uh, there may be a child or children who are being uh, who are not playing or who, who do not necessarily share in uh, the the cultural practice uh, of the school or the classroom for that matter, in this case, hand raising, which I think one of our participants, Carol, has said uh, uh, some students may not be from uh, cultures or cultural backgrounds where competition is, engaged, is encouraged. And um, other pitfalls include racial erasure. So equity is uh, acknowledging, appreciating and affirming students' personal identities related to race, culture, national origin, gender, and gender expression. In fact, when we think about equity and we're we're not we're specifically not talking about approaching this um, in terms of color blindness, but particularly thinking about and recognizing the role of race, but not only race, gender, national origin, et cetera, play and in, in when confronted with evidence of systemic bias and disparities in student outcomes. So when we see evidence of uh, disproportional uh, treatment, um, disproportional outcomes, that we ask ourselves as equity-minded educators, uh, how how does race um, enter the, this? What we're seeing? How how is gender? Uh, what role is gender playing in terms of how we as educators are reacting to, interacting with, with our students? Um, and, and and remembering that I, I talked about earlier the connection to this idea or concept of equity and uh, the and in in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act that specifically we we're called to to question whether or not all of our students are benefiting from our educational programming. So if, if groups of students are, let's say, being excluded from benefiting from a uh, rich educational experience because of um, disciplinary policies and practices, then they're not able to benefit. Or because of various placement policies and practices, um, then they're not able to benefit from from our, our educational programming. So it, it, it requires us to take a look at patterns 
um, and, and then do what we need to do systemically to address those patterns. So Paul brought up a point requiring equity in dif is differentiating. Does that mean moving towards individual education plans for all students? Um, that's a great question, Paul. And, and um, my take on that is that what it requires is for educators to be uh, flexible and in the way in which they can implement um, uh, different uh, instructional practices and make different instructional decisions based on the needs of the student in real time and also to be planful about uh, designing lessons and activities that are universally designed for all students. So we, we may not be talking about separate individual lesson plans, if you will, in terms of being a teacher for each student, but we are talking about teachers having a variety of instructional practices and instructional skills and, and within their toolkit, if you will, to be able to differentiate their actions on the spot or meet the needs of their students. And so when um, James talked about providing multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement, um, that's really critical. Um, those are concepts that are embedded in the universal design for learning framework. And it's really designing curriculum so that um, embedded in the activities are multiple ways in which students can demonstrate what they know, multiple ways that the adults can facilitate learning for students and, and act as learning mediators for students, and teachers really recognizing multiple ways of motivating and engaging students. And so whether we're thinking about that in terms of individual plans, or whether we're thinking about that in terms of um, designing curriculum as universal, universally designed curriculum, it, 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 it does require us to not have that one size uh, fits all kind of uh, orientation to, to instruction. Exactly. Thank you, Eva, in terms of the university. Yes. So uh, uh, that sort of framework for instruction is something that's very useful, a very useful strategy for um, creating equitable learning environments. Thank you. So as you can see, there's a relationship. It's almost like a hand-in-glove relationship between equity and equality. In fact, we cannot have equality in terms of true, authentic, equal access uh, to quality learning experiences if we don't have equity, if we don't engage in practices that will um, support all students. And students need different things. And so what may work for one student to allow them to access the curriculum may not work for a different student. And, and so we have to, A, as, as teachers and as educators, really know our students know our students' lived experiences so that we can connect to their lived experiences, know our students' uh, talents and learning preferences, know our students' strengths. Um, we need to not just know those um, uh, uh, identities and characteristics about our students, but actually use them as we design instruction, as we create our instructional environment. That the equity um, is essential in order for us to really realize uh, equality. Equity ensures that we have equal access to, to participate and make progress in high quality, rigorous, uh, and relevant learning experiences for all students, regardless of their characteristics. So we're talking about, and uh, Eva also brought up a good point in terms of disability. We haven't really mentioned ability or disability um, up until this point, but, but disability and ability, that's the, those are equity issues as well. And so we think about all students and their characteristics and that we are ensuring that everyone has access. And equity ensures that each student has an equal opportunity for life success by preparing and positioning students to enter um, into a, a college, college or career um, of their choice. And so, you know, I really support the, the and champion the idea that as educators, we should prepare all students for, for college and university, whether or not they are planning on going to college or not, um, by not preparing all students for that then we are, in fact, making a choice for them. So whether or not students choose to go on to college after uh, secondary, um, their secondary experience, um, that's their choice at that point. But if we don't prepare every student to be able to enter college or university, um, then we are, we are, in fact, 
um, eliminating one of the options. And so we, that should be something that we're, we're striving for, striving towards, and preparing young people to be able to make that choice when, when the time comes. And thinking about equity and creating equitable environments um, prepares us for that or supports us in, in, in making, um, creating policies, enacting policies, creating learning environments, and engaging in practices that will help to ensure that. Equity begins really with understanding the cultural nature of learning. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Okay, thank you, Sina. Uh, so basically, what we're saying here is that uh, teaching and learning uh, culturally mediated activities. Uh, or in other words, we are saying that when you teach, you're basically teaching through uh, a medium or teaching over a medium of your culture and a student's culture, and um, that uh, learning is mediated by social interactions with people, tools, and shared experiences. And uh, culture being dynamic, of course, we know culture will change. But, uh, but basically, uh, learning and teaching are culturally mediated. And what is taught and how instruction occurs communicate what is valued in a culture, in this case of a one story um, uh, being able to show that you know um, by raising your hand uh, is a cultural practice among other cultures, while in some cultures that may not be the uh, a valued practice. So, uh, by teachers uh, or teaching can be can be improved if teachers have a better understanding of student cultures, student behaviors, backgrounds, and even student experiences. Uh, and teachers should strive to understand student cultures as much as possible because uh, by understanding student cultures, teachers will certainly improve uh, instruction. So changing for equity requires that we change how we think. It requires that we change what we say, so how we communicate, and what we do. Moving towards equity, let's start with talking about how we think. So, and, and many of you mentioned this earlier in re response to the one scenario, but we might catch each other and, and earn ourselves sort of engaging in, in deficit thinking at, at points. But we have to reframe the way we think about our families and our students and each other from a deficit uh, point of view, and even when um, sometimes uh, deficit thinking is sort of cloaked in this sort of um, uh, let's be realistic or um, just want to um, don't want to have a, a situation that's too uh, difficult for students, and we just want to be realistic. The whole notion of being realistic sometimes, and I put the, I'm using air quotes. I know you all can't see me, but I'm using air quotes for that term of realistic. Oftentimes, is used um, as sort of a a, a proxy really for um, thinking that a student can't do something and that and that um, in, in lowering expectations. So this whole notion of reframing deficit thinking to creating opportunities to learn. So how are we thinking about that young person who enters into our classroom who's an uh, English learner, um, not thinking that this person has limited English, but thinking about this person is a multilingual uh, language speaker and how that um, really enriches uh, our learning environment. Um, this whole notion of changing our deficit dis discourse, how we talk to each other about students and how we allow students to talk to each other uh, about each other and about their own learning, their own capability um, to, to learn and master uh, information and content, to using language of possibility, language of affirmation, and demonstrating a value of diversity um, by talking about other perspectives by allowing other people to to um, share their stories and voice their perspectives and points of view. And then lastly, thinking about revising the stratifying programming that we often put in place in schools, from um, tracking students um, at the middle school and high school levels to even um, sort of the, the um, ability grouping that we do so often in, in elementary settings. Um, so trying to move away from those kinds of uh, programming and grouping students to more heterogeneous, uh, flexible grouping for students, um, grouping students based on talents and um, uh, 
interest as opposed to um, having sort of this sort of static kind of uh, grouping structure based on um, uh, ability that, that then strat stratifies students oftentimes even more. Um, to looking at how do we negotiate agreements for cultural practices that create an inclusive learning environments that are supportive, that are respectful, and that are responsive. So all of this, everything that we've been talking about this afternoon and you all have been sharing and reflecting on, um, really there are implications for uh, policies, um, people, and practices. There are implications for creating equitable learning environments that's really anchored in policies, policies as text and also policies that are, are, are normative practices that we just engage in every day. It becomes, if you will, unspoken policy um, that make up the hidden curriculum in our schools, um, whether we're talking about the district level, the school level, or the classroom level that equity has implications for uh, people in our, in our learning community. Um, what are the dispositions that, that we need to have as educators that will um, open us up to moving forward and advancing equity? What do we need to be aware of? Um, uh, um, James talked about being aware of, of our students' cultural backgrounds and cultural histories and practices. Um, what do we need to be aware of about ourselves, our own cultural identities and personal identities, and how our own identities really um, affect the decisions that we make? And then skills, are the skills and competencies that we have. And then practices, our everyday practice. What do we do in terms of the curriculum materials that we use, the structural decisions that we make, and the ways in which we interact with one another, our students, and our families? Oh, uh, okay. Hi, hi, James. We can, we can't hear you. Uh, are you all able to hear me? Let me repeat that. Sorry, my mic wasn't turned on. Okay, okay. okay very quickly. Uh, we uh, we had indicated uh, as our third objective that we are going to provide uh, uh, strategies for us to critically examine our own practices. Uh, these strategies have to do with um, assessing our own practices by ourselves having a colleague assess our own practice, and then um, also taking time to observe critically our students' participation to observe uh, the rates of engagement, whether it's by race or by gender or by social class. So we are providing you with uh, two uh, tools which should be downloadable and available for you to, to begin using right away. Thank you, James. So we are at the end of our presentation. Um, these, Camilla is going to put them up quickly so you can download them if you uh, would like to. They're also, they will also be available on our, our website. So just to close out, um, again, when we think about, you know, why equity now? Um, and Camille, if you can just go back to that slide and, and uh, we will wrap up our time. Um, to ensure everyone has opportunity to learn, to ensure equal access and participation in quality learning experiences, and to prepare all students for success in a global community. Thank you all. Thank you for hanging in there with us. You've been great. Thank you for participating. Um, again, we will leave the, the webinar up uh, for a couple of minutes if you have any additional questions. Um, and we'd like to, um, again, download any of the uh, tools that, we, that James talked about. Um, you, if you look at the bottom of your screen there, you will see the Certificate of Completion PDF. Feel free to download that Certificate of Participation. Um, if you will need to use that for your local professional development committee uh, for CEUs or credit, feel free to do that. Um, uh, here's a list of our references. And again, 
all of these materials will be accessible on our website. So, um, and please look out for future uh, webinars coming to you soon. So, thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you, and bye.